<laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for taking you know the time out of your Friday evening to tune into this Friday app. Um, it's awesome to see so many people already on the call, um, and obviously we had a bit of chit chat before this, um, but it was nice to you know meet a few of you and, and hear a little bit about what you're studying um, down at NUS. Um, so you know, as Daryl introduced me earlier, my name is Harry, uh, and I'm a software engineer at a company called Jane Street Capital. Um, now, Jane Street is a uh, is an electronic trading firm um, and we're headquartered in New York over in the United States um, but we primarily trade a, a class of, of uh, financial products called exchange traded funds and these exchange traded funds or ETFs for short um, along with many other financial products are generally listed in many different exchanges around the world so we trade a lot in Europe as well um, and also in Asia um, and kind of as, as part of that business, we, we have offices in London as well as Hong Kong. Um, so I've been a software engineer in our Hong Kong office now since I graduated um, from where, where Daryl mentioned earlier. Uh, so I studied a bachelor's of, of science majoring in computer science down at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, and then after I, after I graduated there about two and a half years ago, I came to join Jane Street as a software engineer. So realistically, you know, it hasn't been all that long since I was sitting in your seat on the other side of these calls and, um, you know, joining in these student events. Um, so hopefully this will be somewhat relatable, uh, at least. Um, now, I must admit, I did, I did a bit of research before or when I was preparing for, for this talk um, and I stumbled across the NUS Hackers YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. Um, I was incredibly impressed at, first of all, obviously, the, the quality of the talk. Some of the speakers that you guys have had uh, before in this series, you know, have been, have been awesome. Um, and then also just at the frequency as well. Uh, is it right, Daryl, that you're, you're having these every single Friday? Um, so usually it's every single Friday, but this semester, because it's virtual, we're doing it like once every two weeks. Right. Well, even once every two weeks, uh, that's incredibly impressive to have such a, um, you know, such a frequent tech talk series. Um, and I think speaks volumes, obviously, about the the culture down at NUS that you can get so many, uh, so many people on a on a call like this. Um, I think, yeah, I saw on the YouTube channel. This is uh, well, the previous talk that was uploaded was talk number one hundred and ninety four. So this must be talk number one hundred ninety five. And I think the Zoom link confirmed my. Uh, my suspicion if, if I pause that. So that's got to be close to four years or longer if you're running these every fortnight. Um, so that's great to see. Uh, and then of course, you know, before I get going, I want to, to thank um, Daryl and Stephen um, and Chaitanya and everybody else who helps to organize these events for, for inviting Jane Street back to speak, um, to speak this year. I know that we've spoken at NUS a few times uh, over the past couple of years. I know some of my, my colleagues have given a, a few talks. But um, we really appreciate, obviously, uh, you know, getting the invite back. Uh, and it's always enjoyable for us to interact with students from NUS and, um, well, usually meet you in person and, and get to, you know, spend a bit of time getting to know you. But of course, um, we're going to be doing this via Zoom today. Um, but yeah, I appreciate all the effort that you guys put into to, uh, to organizing this call today. Um, we talked a little bit before, um, kind of as we were as we were starting the call. But for those of you who just joined, uh, I want to emphasize, um, I want this talk to be as conversational as possible. Um, if you have any questions that come up throughout the content, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask, uh, uh, ask away. Um, uh, also, if you, if you don't feel comfortable unmuting yourself, I know there's this Q&A box that you can type questions into in, uh, in Zoom, and I'll try to monitor that as best as I can and respond to some of the, the questions that you might have. Um, uh, and then also, I know, obviously, it's a Friday night. Uh, nobody wants a um, kind of uh, nobody wants just a, a boring old, old lecture um, from me or a, or a bit of a monologue. So uh, I'm going to be asking you guys you guys a number of questions throughout, and hopefully we'll, we'll get a bit of a response. Um, and uh, to sweeten the deal a little bit, I know that one thing that has been lacking, given there's there's no on-campus events this year, I know that there's been no swag being able to hand, be handed out at these. Uh, uh, at these recruiting events. So we might be able to, I might be able to rustle a few things up from the back of the recruiting closet and send it down to anybody who gets some of the questions right a little later on. Um, so, uh, so we'll have to see about that. Um, but yeah, without, without further ado, I guess uh, today I'm gonna talk about online algorithms. 
and uh, in particular I'm going to introduce a piece of technology which is a, a library that was built at Jane Street um, by some software engineers here um, that allows us to take basically arbitrary computer programs um, and turn them or represent them as online algorithms and, uh, and then have them respond to updates in their input pretty efficiently. Um, now, I do want to caveat this with the fact that if none of that made any sense to you, uh, I know it's pretty late on a Friday to be, to be thinking about sentences that long with that many complicated words. Um, so please don't worry, I'm going to you know, build everything up from the ground up and make sure that um, by the end of this talk, you understand all of these different concepts and why a financial firm like Jane Street might be interested in a concept such as online algorithms. Um, cool. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about uh, a problem um, or a challenge that's kind of fundamental to Jane Street's business, and that is just the, uh, the, the problem of figuring out what the value of a stock should be. Um, I'm then going to give a bit of a, a recap into uh, online algorithms and offline algorithms and um, a few of the trade-offs between the two different approaches um, and where or uh, what kind of problems um, offline and online algorithms are, are suited towards. Um, and then following that, I'm gonna introduce uh, quite a cool way of thinking, um, at least at least that I, that I think it is cool, um, which is uh, a way of representing computer programs as directed acyclic graphs and then um, introducing a body of work called self-adjusting computations. And there's a, a bunch of literature out there and, and PhD theses written on the subject um, that are basically, well, it's basically just a fancy term for computations that can respond efficiently to changes in their inputs. Um, so that's self-adjusting computations. And then, and then after that, I'm gonna introduce this library, which is called Incremental. Um, and this is the library that was built at Jane Street and is now uh, open source and available on GitHub that allows us to uh, represent basically arbitrary computer programs uh, as self-adjusting computations. Um, great. So to begin with, let's take a little look at this problem of how to value a stock. Um, so uh, one thing that as, you know, as an electronic trading company, um, one kind of uh, task that's that's fundamental to our business is building computer models uh, that can come up with a value for what a stock should be worth. Um, now you can imagine in this in this amazingly designed slide that the uh, the lambda um, logo in the middle is this computer is this computer model. It's some black box algorithm that we don't need to think about too too much about right now. Um, but the output of this algorithm is going to be some price um, that represents the price of some stock. Um, now, I know that a number of you uh, who may be following the Wall Street Bets subreddit uh, might be thinking that uh, valuing the stock is actually just a very simple, uh, it's just a simple uh, a problem and that it doesn't need much thinking about. Um, but hopefully by the end of this slide, I'll be able to convince you that um, it's actually a lot more complex than a lot of people uh, give it credit for. Um, so you can imagine some hypothetical, uh, some hypothetical model that that we might have to, to value one stock would be to uh, take as input um, some current, kind of current quarterly earnings reports. So the value of some stock uh, could very closely depend on, on how well that company is doing in the current quarter. Um, now it's actually interesting that that information correlates so well with, with stock price because uh, that information is often not available until the end of the quarter. You know, you don't know how much a company has earned until the, the kind of quarter period has finished. Um, so in order to approximate that data, uh, we have to kind of rely on either historical reports or analyst expectations or earnings estimates um, in order to kind of approximate the data that we actually care about. Um, so uh, kind of in this way, uh, the data set that, we're, of, that we're, we're sometimes using in order to model these stocks um, contains only partial data. It doesn't contain the actual data that we want and it doesn't basically tell the full story. Um, uh, and then also, just like the fact that it doesn't, you know, contain all of the data that we need, um, it can, you know, we can receive new earnings reports in the middle of the day. We can receive new analyst estimates um, and the market may respond to that. So we need to make sure that we're going to incorporate that in our model. Um, so just as this data is partially available, um, it also gets updated throughout the day and we need our model to be able to efficiently kind of, uh, respond to that. 
Um, and then likewise, another piece of, uh, or another type of input that we might have into one of these computer models is um, basically the stock prices for a, for a basket of related stocks. Uh, so for this hypothetical stock that we're, we're modeling here, you could imagine that the price of it relates closely to the price of Tesla or the price of Apple or the price of maybe a couple of hundred different, uh, different stocks um, that are traded out there on exchange. And so um, we also want to take the prices that these stocks are currently trading at into this model. So that adds another couple of maybe a couple of hundred parameters um, for our model. But also there's no real single price that these individual stocks are willing to be traded for. Um, really each of these logos here represents basically a data set um, of time series data and uh, and so over over the day many people are trading tesla many people are trading apple and so the prices can change and so we have to have um, models that can basically update relatively efficiently uh, to this you know very quickly changing data um, now here, uh, I've obviously been talking about a very simplistic um, hypothetical model, but in reality, the models that we use at Jane Street could contain millions of different parameters, um, whether it's a large neural network or some kind of complicated decision tree. Um, they're certainly not as simple as, as what I've described just here on the, on the screen. Um, and so you can imagine if, if these millions of parameters or, or certainly thousands of inputs are, are changing very quickly, um, a lot of complexity comes along with that. And then also, as I said before, Jane Street's uh, a financial firm. We trade on a couple of hundred different venues around the world. And so we don't just have a single model. We have many different models. Um, and some of them will take similar inputs. Um, some of them are very large. Some of them are very small. Um, but ultimately, we need, um, we need them to be relatively efficient when, we're, when they're responding to changes in their inputs. Um, otherwise, uh, basically, uh, we can't scale very well as a company. You know, we don't necessarily want to, to give each of these models their own Linux server in some data center somewhere in the world. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of one problem that we face. Um, I now wanna uh, do a bit of a recap of online algorithms um, and what I mean by that term. And then also uh, introduce um, a couple of, well, an example of an offline and an online approach to a problem. Um, that will hopefully illustrate why we think online algorithms are a, are a good uh, are a good fit for for problem kind of the problems that I just described. Um, so for those of you who don't who don't remember, uh, let's take a little step back to algorithms 101 and uh, talk about what the definition of an online algorithm is for for a second. So an online algorithm is simply an algorithm that can process its input piece by piece uh, and then provide a partial solution without requiring the full data set up front. Um, and then one important characteristic of an online algorithm, at least that we care about, certainly in, uh, when tackling problems like, like valuing stocks, is that uh, the online algorithm should be able to efficiently update its solution uh, once new data is available without needing to recompute the entire solution from scratch. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's the description of an online algorithm. Um, and to kind of illustrate uh, illustrate an online algorithm, let's take a let's take an example problem. So suppose we have this partial data set. Um, now this is just an array of integers. Um, you can see we've got six, three, nine, one, seven, um, and here we're just representing that uh, we don't know how this sequence continues, but it's possible for new elements to be added or appended to the end of this array. Um, such that the data set grows after we've started sorting it. Um, so ultimately we want to end up with a sorted array, uh, but we need a way of getting there somewhat efficiently um, without you know, spending too much time recomputing the, uh, the solution. So uh, if we were to take the kind of traditional offline algorithm approach, uh, you might choose selection sort, which again, um, for, uh, for those of you uh, who are you know, forgetting a little bit of algorithms 101 here, uh, selection sort is just uh, an algorithm which scans through the unsorted section of the array, and then it chooses the smallest element that remains in that unsorted section, and then it appends that element onto the back of some sorted, uh, sorted section that it's building up along the way. Um, so uh, after three iterations of this selection algorithm, 
um, we might have a sorted set or a sorted portion of the array that looks a little bit like this. So we first selected the one, we put it at the front, we then selected the three and we appended it to the back of this section. Uh, and then we did the same with the six. Now, if we have a two arrive in our data set here, can anybody tell me what selection sort is going to do with this or on the next iteration of its of its selection algorithm? Do we have any guesses? Yeah, some in the chat. Uh, oh, let me take a look. Um, Q and A. This is actually um, relatively embarrassing. Do I just take a little, do I just press this Q and A button down at the bottom? Um, I, I think people are putting their, their answers in the, in the Zoom chat. How do I, is there a, is there a button to go to the Zoom chat from this, uh, from this window? Uh, I think you need to find. Oh, I see. Sorry. Something. Sorry. I've got it. Um, There's probably like a <laughs> I told you yeah. you're the Zoom, you're the Zoom <laughs> experts, yeah. Um, okay. Let me scan these quickly. Uh, geez. Yeah. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of different answers. That's great. One, three, six, two is one that I see, which is nice and concise. Um, so uh, yeah, precisely right. So what's going to happen is um, selection sort is going to uh, is going to basically select this two and append it to the back of this this section, um, which is clearly wrong. Clearly, you know, this has kind of violated the uh, the the invariant that this first section of the array is going to be sorted, um, and so selection sort obviously can't handle um, uh, it can't handle new data appearing after it started its, uh, its algorithm. Now, on the other hand, uh, let's take a little look at insertion sort. Um, let me, I think I might turn off. Can you guys still see the slides here? Okay, perfect. Um, so now let's take a little look at insertion sort. So, Again, just as a recap, insertion sort, what it does is it considers the next element in the unsorted section of the array, and then it finds the place uh, within the sorted section and it inserts the element at that point. Um, so after three iterations, we have sorted the first three elements. We have three, six, nine in place. Uh, and again, if anybody can anticipate the question, what are we going to do with this two here? Do you think the two is going to go at the end, like selection sort had, or, or I might have given the away the answer there, um, or or at the beginning? Okay, it seems like at least from the chat, unless I'm. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So somebody uh, answered in the in the chat. Um, the two remains where it is. You know, there was a bit of a trick question here where insertion sort doesn't consider the two. Um, on the next section, uh, it actually just grabs this one, which is the next element to consider, uh, puts it in place um, at the front of this sorted array, uh, and then continues on its merry way. Um, so insertion sort is the kind of um, online equivalent to the selection sort algorithm, which failed when we saw this new data appended to the end of the data set. Um, so I think from these slides, there's one huge takeaway, which is um, certainly at least for the problems that I described in, with the, when we're valuing stocks, where we have new data appearing, um, appearing all the time, um, online algorithms uh, are much better than, than offline algorithms. Um, and so what is the natural thing to do? Well, we clearly have to just like online all the algorithms, right? We just have to take all of our algorithms that we want to use for uh, valuing these stocks and turn them into online algorithms, um, and I think that this is something that is uh, this is something that's going to be um, well, I think fairly trivial in the case of a sorting algorithm. 
Um, so imagine that you were uh, put in a room with selection sort. I think that most people in that room uh, by the end of the day could come out with insertion sort as, as a sorting algorithm that can uh, handle new data appearing. Um, but in fact, it becomes relatively non-trivial uh, just when you make things you know, slightly more complicated where you might have uh, a computer program which materializes its config from um, some Postgres database and then it also receives streaming updates from the exchange about prices of different stocks. Um, it's not as simple to just take some kind of static approach to a problem and then turn it into an online algorithm. There is not necessarily always a, a, a mapping between the two. Um, great. Uh, so now that we understand, now that we understand the kind of difference between online and offline algorithms, um, I want to introduce this idea of self-adjusting computations. Um, so a self-adjusting computation is just the uh, is just a fancy term for computations that can be updated efficiently when their inputs change. Um, now, uh, the reason I'm introducing this now is because it comes with some, some nice no notation that we can use, um, which are called computational graphs. And computational graphs are a way of, uh, are a way of diagramming out um, a different computation or computer program in such a way that we can easily see the dependencies um, and how data flows through this graph. Um, so here's an example where we have this small computation and the goal is just to sum two integers. We have three plus five is obviously equal to eight. Um, so these graphs, as you can see, they're directed. We have flow from the variables on the left um, through these kind of transformation functions here to the outputs on the right. Um, so they're directed and they're also acyclic. So we can't just keep going round and round and round and uh, have some never ending computation. Um, uh, and that's, well, well, the directed part is actually quite important because it, it kind of indicates that there are dependencies in this graph where um, the, the value at this particular node here, uh, at the plus node, depends on its input, where the inputs are three and five. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. We'll, I'll explain a little bit more kind of how these dependencies are used in a way that allow us to, um, to build online algorithms from, from static approaches. Um, now, just to clear up some terminology before I go a little bit deeper into this talk, there are two kinds of nodes in these graphs. Um, the green ones I'm going to be calling variable nodes, and there are inputs to our, to our computation. They're things that might potentially change in the future. Um, and the, the blue nodes are the transformation functions or the computed nodes, which operate on inputs or other nodes in the graph. Um, so, of course, you can all do three plus five in your head. That's way too trivial. Um, so let's take a little look at, um, at another uh, example of, of using a computational graph to express some computation. Um, so we went through algorithms 101 slightly earlier on. Now let's go through linear algebra 101. Um, remember that the, uh, or in order to, to figure out the value at cell ij when we're multiplying two matrices together, we need to take the dot product of the row at, um, at index i in the first matrix and the column at index j in the second matrix. Um, and the dot product is just a fancy way of saying we're gonna uh, basically take the product of two elements in this vectors and then sum them together. Um, so now let's take a look at the computational graph that, that we will have if, if we want to take the dot product of these two vectors, a and b. Um, so, here we have uh, obviously our inputs. These are the variables that can change. So these are the values at B0, A0, B1, A1, and so on. Um, the first operation, the first transformation function is just gonna be multiplying them together. Um, after that, we have to take the output of this node and uh, sum it together with, well, some other integer. To begin with, it's gotta be zero. Um, and then the output of this, this summation just gets summed with the next, uh, the next product in that vector. Uh, so this is how we represent the, uh, the dot products of a two element uh, of two two element vectors. Um, you can imagine this stretching on for n nodes um, if we had uh, n nodes in the uh, or n, n elements in the vector. Um, but one really cool thing here is that uh, well we start to see subgraphs within this graph. In the example that I had before, where 
we just had this very simple, very trivial problem. If we were to basically, if any of these inputs were to change, we'd still have to recompute the entire graph because, well, the entire graph is just one transformation function. Um, there's no real difference between an offline or an online approach in such a simple model. Um, but now, when we, once we have a bit more of a complex graph, um, well, we start to see subgraphs where suppose that B0 and A0 were to stay the same. Those, the elements in, in some new vector were actually equal to the old B0 and A0. Well, then the value at this, this node would remain the same. And we don't actually need to recompute anything in this part of the graph. We can just take its old value uh, and add it to whatever the new, the new product of these two elements is. Um, so we start to see uh, basically dependencies in this graph and cutoff points where we can stop computation and not recompute any values because we know that the, the input variables haven't changed. Um, so all of a sudden we start to see, well, efficiencies that we can, we can use when recomputing this model just from basically fanning it out as a graph um, rather than uh, you know, enumerating the, the different uh, operations in this matrix multiplication. Um, great, so we've talked a little bit about uh, obviously summing two integers. We've talked about uh, taking the dot product of two vectors. We still haven't actually seen any code or any computer programs that use um, these self-adjusting computations or, or denoted in as a computational graph. Um, so I now want to take you through an example of a self-adjusting computer program, which as you can see is just a, a computer program that ups, updates efficiently when its inputs change. Um, now, this is a bit of a risky example because uh, I've heard that some uh, large tech companies, not Jane Street, but some other tech companies use this as, uh, or use this problem as an interview question. So I hope that I don't create any PTSD uh, for, for anybody in the room. Um, but the problem is a problem called FizzBuzz, and you might have heard of it before. Um, the, the, the basic outline of it is that um, the candidate in the interview has to print out the integers from one to 100, and if the integer is divisible by three, they should, instead of printing the integer, return or print out the string fizz. Um, if it's divisible by five, they should return buzz, um, and if it's divisible by both, both three and five, then they should print out fizzbuzz instead. Um, so you can see here one kind of implementation in Python, um, and we just have a bunch of if statements and we're returning the appropriate strings. Um, now, instead of writing this in code, if we were to uh, break this down and look at it as a, a computational graph, you can see that we have one variable here, which is i. So that's the free variable in this function, the thing that's going to be changing. Um, this is input into some transformation function, which initially is just the modulo operator. You can see that this maps one for one here with this if statement. Um, and it's obviously modulo with three and we get some integer result. Um, now we can obviously extend this, uh, this computational graph to include the equals check here, where we're checking with the results of the modulo operator with zero. Um, we can then introduce this second modulo operator, uh, where we're checking if it's divisible by five. And then finally, we can and these two together, uh, which both, you know, the and function takes two booleans, which are the output of the equals functions, um, and return a result. Um, so, so hopefully this gives you guys a good flavor of how we might represent a, a computer program as a, as a computational graph. Um, let me check the chat for a second and just make sure that uh, there aren't too many burning questions. Um, no, nope, that's great. Everybody seems to be to be following along nicely. Um, cool. So uh, hopefully this has shown you that um, basically, well, we can express these computer programs as uh, computational graphs. Some of these functions might end up being fairly complicated, but it, we're able to to take apart some implementation and uh, and draw it out as a computational graph. Um, now I'd like to. Uh, oh, actually, uh, I forgot about this slide, but it's actually quite cool, so I'll mention it. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a way of saying that um, not only can we um, basically represent these as computational graphs, but we can also uh, basically make this code slightly more efficient than it currently is 
by reusing the structure of the graph and creating dependencies between different nodes um, and taking the output of this modulo operator or this, this equals check and feeding it straight into this and here. So this and is obviously an and of the, the, um, uh, the negated results of this one here. Uh, so as long as we didn't execute this, this section basically, it says, uh, uh, then as, as long as it's equal, uh, as long as it's divisible by five, we should return buzz. Um, so it's quite a, uh, a neat way of, of basically short circuiting and not performing any um, computation device. Um, yeah, so hopefully I've convinced you that, uh, oh, I see, um, somebody has asked the question, can you represent loops in this kind of graph? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, so you can represent uh, uh, some kinds of loops, but if you, uh, based on the algorithms that I'm going to be describing a little bit later on, if you do, uh, you can end up in with pretty bad behavior uh, that causes um, recomputing this graph to be, um, well, uh, fairly inefficient. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, so now that we've seen, uh, obviously, you know, Jane Street has this problem of, of efficiently valuing stocks. Um, we uh, care about online algorithms and, and they, they seem like a relatively nice way to approach the problem. Um, we understand a little bit more about what a self-adjusting computation is and, and the notation available uh, to us in order to, to represent some of these computer programs and computations um, as, as computational graphs. Um, I want to introduce you to the incremental library, which is the one that I've been talking about uh, or that I, that I introduced at the, at the beginning. Um, now the incremental library was designed with three goals in mind. Um, the first of the goals was to make it easy for software developers to write um, and express computer programs as graphs. Um, the second was to provide a mechanism for efficiently recomputing these graphs and uh, updating the output of these graphs when the input variables change. Um, and then kind of one side effect of this is that, uh, well, you can imagine in many different models, if we put in enough hard work and we had enough smart developers, we could write basically all of this, this logic to, to do lazy evaluation and not recompute anything that we, uh, that we don't need to recompute and, and to force results um, uh, or to, to force these, these static algorithms to be online algorithms. Um, well, we could just, you know, if we, if we had enough time and, and enough developers, we could just do that by hand. Um, but one, one nice benefit of uh, providing this functionality in a library rather than in across many different models is that we get to centralize the algorithms involved and we get to uh, optimize them as one kind of single point um, or a single code base rather than optimizing many different systems and their complex dependencies. Um, and then the third goal was that uh, this library should be able to do this without having so much overhead that it counteracts any saving in computation that we get from uh, you know, not recomputing different sections of this graph. Um, so to begin with, uh, I want to introduce the API for the incremental library, which is going to basically uh, tell you all about this, this first bullet point, which um, uh, you know, the goal is obviously to make it easy for software developers to express software as, as graphs. Um, so uh, here is the incremental API. Um, now, for some of you, I understand this is going to be the first time that you're seeing that you're seeing OCaml. Um, so I'll, I'll explain this from from the ground up. So we have some module here, which you can think of as a class. Um, so this is just the the name of the library, incremental. Um, there is some type. Um, and this notation really just represents um, that we can create an object of type incremental.t. That's the kind of terminology here. Um, so uh, there's this funny thing here though that, that says tick a, and, and this is OCaml's way of saying that this type is parameterized by some other type in the system. Um, and the tick a has no restriction on it, which means that it's a generic type. So we can have a string incremental.t, we can have a boolean incremental.t, uh, we can have a string map uh, incremental.t and so on. Um, now one of these incremental objects, these represent nodes in our graph. Um, 
Now, of course, in order to like build a graph, we need a way of creating one of these nodes. Uh, so we have this function called constant. Um, and what constant does is it takes this value, um, which is of type tick A, and then it returns the node that represents that value. Um, so that's great. We have a way of getting constant data into our graph. So this is the node three that's created using that X is equal to constant three. Um, we also have this, uh, uh, we need a mechanism obviously for like transforming the, uh, the inputs that are uh, input into this graph. So we have this function called map, which just takes uh, an object of type tick A incremental dot T. And then it also takes a transformation function which maps from a tick A to a tick B, which is just some other generic type. Um, and it's going to return you back a tick B incremental dot T. Um, for example, we're using the map function here that takes an integer as input and then returns another integer. So in fact, tick A and tick B are equal in this situation. Um, so that's our way of transforming these nodes um, and building on this computation. And then of course, the whole goal of this, um, of this project was really to uh, force or, or to provide a mechanism to efficiently recompute these models. And so we need a way of doing that as well. And that's what this function stabilize does. Um, so what stabilize does is it takes the variables um, or, or it takes the inputs, uh, it takes a snapshot of the inputs um, at a particular point in time. And then it uh, pushes all of the, or forces all of the, the recomputation that's necessary in the graph. Um, such that the outputs will be updated um, kind of with the corresponding inputs. Um, so you can see that after this is executed and stabilized has finished, the output is going to be 8. Um, now, can anybody see an issue with this API and kind of the graphs and representing the graphs that I was talking about earlier? So we had a, a number of different example graphs. Can anybody see how you might build up one or maybe maybe there are some functions lacking. <laughs> Somebody says mentally converting everything into Haskell. <laughs> and, then, and then somebody also says uh, that uh, incremental looks like an applicative, um, which, is, uh, which is actually a, a, pretty, a pretty nice uh, observation here. So Haskell, uh, sorry, incremental is actually a monad, um, and I'll maybe build up to that depending on how much time we have later on. Um, but uh, it's yeah, a little bit more powerful and applicative. Um, and great, so we, we have the answer here. So, so there's no way currently with this API to combine subgraphs. So in this situation, there's no API or function here that allows us to take uh, two nodes and, and squash them down into one node um, that depend on, on two different inputs. So um, here we could create many different linear dependencies within these nodes, but we couldn't combine the, the two graphs. Um, which is great. So, so now we need a function to do that. And this is function is just called map2, um, which is very creative naming, of course. Um, it takes two different incremental dot t's, uh, it takes a transformation function from each of their types, uh, and then it returns an incremental dot t of a new type. Um, great. Uh, so um, now that we have map2, we can create we can create nodes that depend on two different nodes. Can anybody tell me why we don't need map three? Or map four, perhaps, or map a thousand? I mentioned we might have models that have millions of different parameters. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I see Julius's name, that's great. Uh, Julius, you've, you've worked here before, so you might've heard this talk before, uh, but I'll still accept your, uh, I'll still accept your, your answer as correct. Um, so Julius says that uh, we don't need map three because we can compose um, basically n iterations of map two um, as many times as we want in order to squash the nodes down into one graph. So if we had a third node over here, we could compose uh, the, the map two function with that node um, and the output of the previous map two function in order to, to introduce it there. So map two is sufficient here. Um, Great, uh, so can anybody else spot anything else that's missing from the API? So we had, we needed a way that we could squash down uh, graphs uh, or two nodes into, into one node. Can you really spot anything else that's different or, or that's missing?
So this one might be a little, a little tough to figure out. Um, now, basically the whole purpose of this project was to allow our algorithms and our computer programs to officially respond to changes in their input. Um, but right now, we only have this one way of constructing um, a node or injecting data into this graph, and it's called constant, which means this input can never change, right? Um, so we need a way of, of allowing our inputs to change. Um, and that's where this variable module comes in. Um, so we've got this module called variable, which itself has its own type T. Uh, we can create a variable. Um, we can set a variable, so we can change the, the value there. Um, and then we can also watch it in order to turn it into one of these nodes that's in the graph. Um, so the example on the right becomes, instead of using constant, we use var.create, and we can update the value using var.set. Um, great. Uh, so there's, there's kind of one other missing piece, uh, which I'll jump to straight away because I just double checked the clock and I think um, it's getting, uh, getting towards the end of the time, getting a nod from Daryl, which is great. Uh, so there's one other issue, which is that, of course, we can inject this, this data into the graph, which is great. Um, we can push uh, or we can yeah, push updates through this graph and have them transformed by different nodes using the stabilize function. Um, but we obviously, at the end of the day, need that value for that stock. We need the price that we think the stock is worth. Um, and so we need a way for clients to retrieve elements out of this um, uh, out of this graph. And so we have these functions called value, which will return the value at, uh, at that particular node. It's an error to call value before it's been stabilized. Um, then we also have this, this other, other function called on update, which allows you to register a callback on these um, uh, on these nodes, such that any time their their variables or their their, their value changes, um, your callback will be executed. Um, now there are a bunch of other cool things about the incremental library, such as how does stabilize work. Um, it's a bit of a long story, and I'd love to be able to tell you it all today, but I don't want to um, eat into your break or also into to the next speaker's time. Um, what I will encourage you to do, though, uh, if you are interested in the algorithms that um, kind of underlie this, uh, uh, that underlie this library, is I would encourage you to go on YouTube and search for Incremental Jane Street. Um, and there are many different recordings of different talks about this library that will go into the, the details and the depth of how the stabilized algorithms work. Um, so let me go to the end. So yeah, I want to open the floor now briefly just to kind of uh, take any questions from you guys. Um, are there any questions on anything that I had to say today? Uh, somebody asks, how does this compare to FRP? I must admit, I'm not familiar with the acronym FRP. If you could spell that out, I might be able to take a stab at it. Um, but also the question might be uh, above, my, above my knowledge. Functional reactive programming. Uh, again, that's a great question. Uh, I must admit, I don't know what functional reactive programming is. Um, I'm going to have to go and do some Googling uh, after this talk. Oh, great. Uh, Abdul uh, explains, functional reactive programming is a paradigm for managing streams of data changing over time. Um, well, that sounds very, very similar, actually. Um, uh, I'm not sure how it reacts to or uh, how it allows you to represent arbitrary computer programs like incremental does, um, but it could just be another approach to, to the same problem. Um, thanks for letting me know about that. While we're waiting for, I'm happy to take a few more questions, but while we're waiting for them to come through or, or if, um, well, if they do come through, um, I want to briefly plug our electronic trading challenge that's happening um, virtually uh, for students at NUS. Um, so there, I think, will be some details at janestreet.com slash join janestreet slash events. Um, the electronic trading challenge is heaps of fun. It's a whole day where you get to build your own trading bots and trade on a fake exchange, um, trying to make more money than your classmates. Uh, and there are cash prizes uh, for the people that, that are most successful on the exchange. Um, so I'd highly recommend you sign up to do that. Uh, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, I think maybe uh, the NUS Hackers Group might also have a few more details on that event. Um, so maybe we can send them down to you guys. Um, 
Great. Well, it seems like there aren't any more questions. Um, so that's all that I had to cover today. Thanks very much for, um, for you know, allowing me to come and speak to you, um, or at least speak to you virtually. Um, it's been nice to, to meet a few of you and, uh, and also be a part of the, the 195th Friday Hack. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Harry, for giving this talk. Um, I think we definitely learned quite a bit. Um, so I think now what we'll be doing is we're running a bit late on time, but we'll still go for a short break. So um, we'll go for a, like a four to five minute break and come back at um, 7.55 for our second talk. But once again, yeah, thank you so much, Harry, for the talk. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. See you. Thank you, Harry. All right, is, uh, is everyone able to see the screen? See the slides? Yep. Yep, okay, all right, thanks. Um, hi everyone, so good evening. Um, so today I, I we're having a, uh, a little talk on our uh, journey with Kubernetes and since our one year uh, in production for Kubernetes adoption. So uh, let me give a little bit of my uh, introduction to myself. So. Uh, my name is Jiang Huan. So I was graduated from uh, NTU in back in 2016. Uh, I, I majored in computer engineering. So I've been working uh, in Tenensoft for four years now. So uh, it's actually my first job. Uh, I I have a very cute cat called Echo uh, at home with me. And uh, uh, for the cat lovers, uh, we do have an Instagram you can follow. Uh, at EIKOG underscore cat. So, um, so you can find more about me on my GitHub page. And I also write uh, blogs on Medium. Uh, our company also have a Medium publication for Titansoft Engineering. You can, uh, you can take a look. All right, so uh, that's something about me. And uh, about my company, Titansoft, uh, you can see some pictures of our fun activities, our annual dinners, and uh, and a lot of uh, like out, out having having dinner together. So um, for our company, we develop uh, online platforms for our clients. Um, we are mainly developing web applications, and recently we also start developing um, uh, uh, native applications like Flutter. So uh, we also maintain infrastructures for our clients on premise, uh, our own data center, and also mm -hmm. on public cloud. So we uh, we embrace an agile mindset and we practice uh, Scrum in our software development process. Uh, for my team, um, uh, I, I worked in a team uh, that we formed uh, about, uh, consists of a few senior engineers uh, called Research and Development Team that we formed in, about, uh, in early 2019. Uh, so we, we have focused on solving uh, engineering problems across the stack uh, and also solve cross counting concerns uh, across multiple uh, product teams and offices. Uh, we also try to set technical directions and we, we do research projects like uh, surveying technologies and bringing about innovations uh, to our stack. And, uh, and also we push uh, standardization of tools and frameworks across uh, our three offices. So yeah, that's something about my company and my team, uh, about what, what will my team do. All right, so for uh, the agenda of this talk today, uh, I would like to start with why uh, sharing about why Kubernetes is so popular and why you should learn Kubernetes. And next is uh, I will give a very brief introduction to container and, and Kubernetes technologies and with a, uh, with a very uh, simple short demo on how to work with Kubernetes. Um, and next uh, I will share about, about our journey with Kubernetes. So about how we started, uh, what's our current, uh, current adoption status and what the benefits we get. And of course, uh, Kubernetes is not a silver bullet. So uh, I will share some of the difficulties and areas we find it's not easy to work with uh, Kubernetes. And at last, I think for those who are getting more interested into Kubernetes, I will share some links to resources uh, you might want to utilize and uh, to learn about Kubernetes. So, all right, let's start, start with uh, why Kubernetes is so popular. So if you have been around in the industry, I believe you uh, must heard of Docker and containers and even Kubernetes. Uh, and many companies have shared their success stories 
with Kubernetes, uh, I think for the past few years. Um, I think some of the reasons of uh, Kubernetes being so popular is uh, first being open source and uh, also having a very huge and active community uh, around it. So, um, so actually being open source uh, is a very good sign for enterprises to uh, adopt the technology uh, in my opinion. So um, uh, actually because it, it actually uh, most, uh, most of the time it will uh, save some license cost uh, for infrastructure, for example, for Kubernetes. And, and, and also there's a less risk of vendor locking if it's open source. And Kubernetes have uh, been have developed a very huge community and ecosystem. So uh, for the Kubernetes uh, GitHub repo alone, there have been about thousands of contributors worldwide. Uh, and, and, and actually all major cloud vendors like uh, AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Azure, uh, like DigitalOcean, um, um, et etc. They, they already uh, bring their products for the competition in this uh, market. So, and also there are countless uh, community applications that are distributed by uh, Helm charts and operators. Uh, uh, for example, like you can, uh, if you have a cluster, you can use a few lines of code to deploy a robust Elasticsearch cluster or, uh, or a Redis failover cluster uh, in your cluster in a breeze. So, um, so Kubernetes has become the de facto container orchestrator. Uh, the other solutions you might have heard, uh, like Docker Swarm, uh, like HashiCorp Nomad, uh, they actually turned out not to be as successful as Kubernetes. Um, so um, from this report in 2019, um, you can see Kubernetes dominates the market of container orchestration by uh, 98 percent, uh, sorry, 89 percent, and so you definitely need to learn about Kubernetes, in my opinion, as a future developers. All right, so that's something about uh, why you should learn Kubernetes. So, and I think next I will give a very brief uh, introduction to containers and Kubernetes technology. So, um, so I also will follow up with a very short demo session that I will deploy a simple application to Kubernetes cluster and, and try to give you a very basic impression of how to work with Kubernetes if you, haven't, uh, if you don't have any experience. So, all right, so let's start with container. So um, containerization is something uh, uh, you can take a look. So uh, here is, uh, actually, uh, it's not. It's uh, actually the technology is not new. Actually, uh, it has been around for decades. So the 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 recent more recent uh, technology like Docker, Rocket, uh, they most, mostly utilize two uh, Linux kernel fixtures, uh, namespace and uh, control groups or C groups. So uh, for for namespace, it used to virtualize the system resources for the uh, for the process for application process like file system. Uh, network access uh, policy and process ID. So, 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 so actually, the application process uh, virtual uh, with virtualization uh, with a containerization, they will see its own ver um, uh, configure configuration of five system. So, uh, it provides a kind of process level isolation um, if you want to run multiple application on a single host. And for the C groups, um, it used to limit the usage of computer resource like CPU time for application. So uh, in case uh, you have a very uh, crazy, maybe a crazy uh, container that use up all your CPU uh, time and C groups were able to control that. All right, so uh, that, and this, all te uh, this technology is based on Linux. So uh, Windows container is also there, but um, probably using similar but different technologies. So, um, so, for, uh, so container is something um, relevant, uh, I, th I think of kind of some, some sort of revolution uh, over traditional virtualization uh, uh, technologies like uh, VM. So, um, so compared to VM, uh, containers uh, use, uh, has, has uh, reduced overhead uh, because VM usually run on hypervisor uh, with, uh, and also you have to run the whole guest OS uh, on the hypervisor. So, um, they will, the performance wise, uh, container will having a slightly benefit. And also, um, 
it will uh, it will become uh, much much faster when you con uh, in terms of boot time. So con start container is something start like a uh, uh, process. It takes like seconds, but ver but start a VM is something uh, if as can be as, as slow as a uh, few minutes. So and uh, I think also around uh, like Docker uh, uh, technology like Docker um, it has to have it has the tools that. Uh, make it much more easier to work with containers uh, with uh, with build tools and image registries, for example. So, and also orchestration in your local development for container is, uh, is, uh, is much more easier compared to VM. So personally, I have much uh, better user experience with container uh, compared to tools like uh, Vagrant for VM. All right, so, um, so about Kubernetes, so uh, Kubernetes is actually an open source project uh, started by Google. Um, so many of this concept uh, inherited from uh, its internal project called Borg. Um, so, so actually I will try to explain what Kubernetes do uh, in very simple fashion. So uh, firstly, um, Kubernetes defines a set of APIs uh, to describe your workloads and your computer resources. So it uh, works kind of abstraction and and in the in the following demonstration, I will show you how you can talk to a Kubernetes API uh, to define the specs of your application deployment. So um, and next, I think Kubernetes uh, distributed uh, distributes workloads uh, across the cluster uh, uh, and manage the container lifecycle. So um, it means that Kubernetes will like schedule your containers to the resources in the in the nodes. Um, so the decisions are, are mostly based on factors like uh, the remaining resource on each node and or any specific rules you have uh, given in the in the specs. So um, for managing uh, container life cycles, uh, it, it means that uh, it helps you, for example, restart a dead container or uh, unhealthy, uh, unhealthy container or uh, move around the containers in the cluster if you find necessary. Uh, for example, during a node pool adjustment. So uh, this is all automated. You don't have to care after you deploy. And, and next, uh, Kubernetes operates the container network and also enables service discovery. So uh, for example, like your service A uh, deployed on Kubernetes across another service B. Uh, so Kubernetes makes sure the request uh, from the service A ends up reaching one of the containers of service B uh, using internal DNS. Um, so, and uh, also supports uh, some level of load balancing internally. So, so, so th therefore uh, your containers in the cluster uh, network together properly. All right, so um, yeah, that's a lot of talking. I think I will, uh, I will give a very uh, quick demo um, deploying a Kubernetes, uh, application on Kubernetes. Um, the source code of this demo you can find here in this uh, in this link. All right, so uh, okay, let's start with with the application I developed. It's a very simple one. It's a you can see it's a Golang app, uh, Golang uh, web service. So it has one endpoint that returns a message, uh, say hi US hackers, uh, and also have seen uh, having a, 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 a generated a random ID that you can distinguish uh, different instances. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy, uh, deploy this application to Kubernetes. So, as, so first uh, we need to uh, containerize this application uh, with a Docker file. So it actually builds the, the application and, and I already done that. So next I think uh, I will going to uh, write a few YAML files. So uh, this YAML file is called a deployment. So this, is the uh, Kubernetes API, um, so that um, so in this uh, in this you can pay attention to a few parts. First is replica. So I have um, defined uh, we, we I want to have one instance for this application. So you can specify multiples and they will demo later. And about the 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 the, the deployments, it contains a, a pool of containers, a pool of instances. So for each instances has a image called NUS Hacker Demo. Uh, version one is the, this application. So, um, so also we uh, specify some of the resource requirements like CPU and memory, 
and also a health check endpoint called readiness prop. So let's go ahead and, and deploy it. Uh, so, so actually I'm running a Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, you can see here. So um, uh, I'm running this one. Um, it's in local. So if I get nodes, you can see uh, has seen only one node called Docker Desktop. So this cluster is uh, is uh, is uh, is installed by Docker Desktop. Uh, so um, so we can use that um, to deploy. And uh, if if you uh, all right, so I think uh, I will start with uh, this part. So I have running a I'm running a, a command to sh to show you all the resources in this NUS hacker namespace I created. So now I'm going to uh, Deploy this. Uh, deploy this application. So you can see here that uh, I already create uh, deployments uh, with the with this uh, with the application uh, with the code I just saw. I just uh, present. So and also I create another thing is service. Service is something like uh, consider like a load balancer. You you, you, can, you can think of that way. So uh, I create this service and this deployment. So now if I go to the uh, application, I, I open this service here. So you can see um, the application is running in the cluster. Uh, I exposed it in the local um, uh, 30,000 port. So you can see here that this is a random number. So for now we have one instance and already running in Kubernetes cluster. And uh, uh, here, oh, sorry, I just forgot to mention, here is actually uh, getting the pods. You, you see what we have one instance, so this is one one part of uh, our uh, application, and this is the service um, we exposed. So, all right, so yeah, this is, uh, this is how we deploy a application on Kubernetes. So next, I think I will going to um, scale up this uh, service uh, to two instance. So what I need to do is, I just need to change the, uh, the specs in this file. So uh, it just, this is kind of idea called de declarative, uh, declarative API, so I just need to declare the things I need. I don't need to uh, tell uh, what tell it what to do, it just specify what I need and I tell the Kubernetes API. So uh, I will do that again. So I will apply again, you see here uh, is configured, becomes configured, and you can already see here that uh, this pod, a new pod is, uh, is starting. So we're getting another instance running in the cluster. So if we visit uh, this application again, oh sorry, I think sometimes it's just uh, uh, some. It sometimes it happens that uh, the all the requests go to the same pod. So uh, I think uh, it's not possible to see uh, here. So yeah. So actually, we're running two instances in the cluster for our demo application. All right. So. Um, I, we can even scale up into maybe five instance. If uh, we can see it here, we can see instantly start start the uh, our our uh, pool of instances here. We can see uh, they are starting one by one. All right, so we have so uh, so we are having um, multiple instances running here, and I think the uh, the next is I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, uh, a release process. So I want to, uh, well, I make change to my application into version two by adding Kubernetes awesome here in the message. So I'm going, to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to release uh, the application online um, without downtime. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change, change the, uh, the, 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 the file here into V2. So this uh, this is image already built from the newer application. So uh, what I'm going to do is just kubectl apply again. You can see, well, the things happening is uh, the new container is starting, uh, and the same time the old the old containers uh, the old version is been terminated. So it's in a, done in the rolling upgrade fashion. So so uh, means uh, it means uh, during the release we have. Uh, uh, online app uh, on service online, but we're doing uh, we replace the our old version with new version one by one, or or you can configure in uh, other fashions that they are you can specify in the in the in the YAML file. So so now we are running the newer version of our application. So if we go to see, you see uh, we are running the newer app, newer uh, newer version. 
All right, so uh, I think, I think uh, that hopefully will give you some very basic impression of how uh, actually working with Kubernetes looks like. So um, let me take a look if there are any questions uh, from you. Oh, sorry, I can't, can't see here. Um, all right, uh, is there any questions you can let me know? I think there is one in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, what's the practice for the YAML files when there are multiple microservices for? Oh, okay. I think this is a very good question. I think um, if you're talking about microservices, uh, it means like you, you're going to have a lot of different applications, right? So uh, in, our, in our practice, we just, uh, for each microservice, it's actually a Git repo. So uh, each Git repo will having its own YAML set of YAML files. And um, I think the principle of microservice that you can deploy each service uh, alone. So, um, and, and each service will have it in uh, guaranteed SLA. So you probably want your application is, uh, or your microservice always online. So, so in our case is we just deploy our own services one by one. So we have need this own individual release pipeline for each, each, each service. Uh, but for uh, some companies, uh, if you want to have uh, uh, um, like orchestration, like a test environment, you probably need to consider using some tools to uh, manage all your release uh, together, like Spinnaker and on those tools. But actually, we are not using that. So yeah, I hope I answered your question. All right. So okay. So all right. Let me. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Let me uh, keep my sites moving. So. So next, I think uh, I will share some of our experiences and uh, journey with Kubernetes. So um, there's a timeline. So we actually start hearing about Kubernetes in about 2017. And at, I think at that time, we actually don't have the chance to work with Kubernetes formally because we are running uh, basically Windows infrastructure and, uh, and we don't have enough knowledge to operate our own cluster. So, uh, so we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't have the chance to work on that at that time. So, and in late uh, 2018, we start using uh, public cloud. So uh, at that time, we deploy our first Kubernetes application on the Google Kubernetes engine uh, for production. So uh, actually, GKE is a very good solution that it worked out of box. Uh, with a few clicks, you can create a cluster and, and also required a very minimum knowledge for us to start with. All right, so I think uh, later on, we find Kubernetes very easy to work with. So we, uh, in our RD team, we introduced Kubernetes to other teams and we, uh, the company decided to use GKE to host our newly launching product. So the product is uh, compared, compared to our service, uh, is, is much larger, larger in size and consists of multiple services. And so, so we, uh, for our approach uh, adoption, uh, the way we uh, uh, the way we introduce is we create a, a paved path, or we can, can we can call it uh, best practices. So we uh, we create uh, documents for uh, the guidelines and also template projects, and so for our teams to start using it. And also we uh, we we solve a lot of issues we encountered um, uh, along the way, and we are getting more experiences uh, during this time. So actually from mid to late 2019, uh, I led the development of our uh, bare metal cluster in our own data center with a solution called Rancher. So, um, so, we, we, so uh, after that, we are managed to operate our clusters uh, on both uh, on-prem and also cloud. So uh, we, therefore we, we kind of create a, a standard platform for application deployment uh, across public cloud and our own data center. It's a kind of achievement. So yeah, so that's our journey. Um, so right now, I think we're running uh, about eight clusters uh, over 50 nodes. And the, the, the all clusters have about 1,000 CPU cores and compute resources. Uh, we're managing about 1.6 thousand containers uh, across the three, our three environments, staging, uh, UET, and production. And uh, it, Kubernetes is used by uh, product teams in three offices. And we, the, we, we support both public cloud on premise for the product teams. So, um, so what's the actual, actual, actual benefits is uh, we actually get uh, 
quite a few uh, benefits from the operation point of view. Um, so I start with uh, declarative deployment. So there's something I just demonstrated. So we can just declare what we want for our application in, in, the, in the deployment. So and there's uh, so there's a declarative versus imperative approach. So uh, yeah, so that's something we we find useful. Um, and rolling upgrade. So it's something we can release our application without downtime. Uh, it's, it's very easy to to do. You just uh, there's some best best practice around that. We also have a blog post on Medium to show how we uh, do zero downtime release for .NET Core applications on Kubernetes. All right. So uh, next is application self uh, self healing uh, means uh, if so, so we have a pool of uh, instances for our application. So if some parts, uh, some part of the um, application instances or even the, the underlying infrastructure uh, has some problem, it's not healthy, uh, the Kubernetes is able to uh, move around the workloads in the cluster and it kind of uh, self heal our, our instances. And also, we are able to achieve uh, auto scaling for our application with a feature called horizontal pod auto scaler. Um, so, uh, for example, we have peak hours. We have more users uh, during peak hours and more traffic. So, during the time, the application workload is able to adjust the the uh, let's say the replica of, it, of itself um, to in, in cope with the more traffic. And also, during the non peak hours, it will reduce to a minimum, a minimum instance, uh, instant replica, so we can save cost on cloud. So we do have a, a, a blog post that actually uh, we find uh, HPA is not working on GKE, and so we write a blog, blog post, on, uh, and also we share how we fix it, and also uh, get uh, get reply from the Google, uh, Google Cloud product managers, and we also discuss about this problem. So they're all in this uh, blog post. And also Kubernetes uh, brings the built-in observability um, with a Prometheus. So, so uh, we are able to uh, monitor everything in the cluster uh, from the infrastructure, from the node to, uh, to CPU memory network, and also to the applications um, status and application logs. We are able, all, all, all is uh, observable and we having a dashboard to, uh, to, to monitor everything is uh, really helpful for, for operation team. And, um, and also there are a lot of tools like Cert Manager that, that handles uh, TLS certificate issuing. Uh, it also renews uh, automatically. Uh, that's uh, really uh, very easy to, to work with. So, um, so as a conclusion, I think Kubernetes, uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, is uh, very suitable for, uh, for for those uh, applications that uh, we, we call a stateless application. So, uh, so those uh, applications uh, have a kind of uh, share nothing architecture that able to scale out uh, via a process model. So uh, things like web services, um, web API service or job workers or event queue uh, consumers. So I think that uh, Kubernetes works best, uh, works even more, works even uh, almost perfect for those. And I think also uh, I think also match some some principles of the twelve factor applications. So, um, if you're familiar with that. So, however, there are things uh, we we find it's not very easy to get right on Kubernetes. Uh, some some parts like uh, we find uh, we some we did have the solution, and some we just try not to do with Kubernetes. So uh, actually, the getting right here, I want to say is like something like production ready. So we, it's kind of uh, uh, stable and production ready. So uh, we can start with uh, stateful applications. So there are applications like uh, require sticky sessions. Uh, so for example, uh, you want the same user client. Uh, always uh, the request all goes to the same instance among uh, among your pool of instances. So uh, it's possible to do with Kubernetes. You, uh, you probably need to configure, uh, have a special configuration for that application. To make it work, and and um, something like databases, deploying databases on Kubernetes uh, is definitely possible, and we are seeing more and more company doing that. But we just found uh, uh, find uh, is is uh, we just 
we are very careful to do that um, because uh, I think uh, loss of data is uh, is much severe than a downtime for web application. So uh, unless we have very good uh, knowledge and experience with Kubernetes, we 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 try not to do that at at start. And uh, storage is not easy to get right um, uh, for on-premise clusters. So uh, you have to think about your underlying um, storage providers. If you're using like VMware, if you're like a bare metal, you probably will going to choose different storage providers on Kubernetes if you need persistence. Uh, and about network, so um, network, uh, network uh, security policies is something like, um, you want to limit uh, restrict applications talking to each other in the cluster. So by default, everything, the network is open for every container to talk to each other. So in order to restrict that, I think uh, there, there's a special configuration uh, you need to apply. Um, and also about bandwidth, uh, bandwidth quota for the container networking. So uh, is try to solve the problem. For example, you have a very crazy container that uh, used up all the network bandwidth. And so, so it will affect the other workloads on the same node. So to restrict the bandwidth usage of the containers, you probably need to look into your uh, container network interface uh, plugins. Um, some that will support that. And it's not, uh, not it's actually it's not very easy to do with Kubernetes. I, we, we just don't find a solution yet. So, and, um, for network, is generally it's not easy to get right for on-premise clusters. Uh, the considerations uh, goes into your uh, level two, level three network, uh, and also the choices of your CNI plugins. So, all right, uh, I think next is uh, I call it heterogeneous infrastructure. So, say we have uh, we have a mixed type of applications. Some are just normal web web services, uh, but others like a machine learning workloads. Uh, may require like special hardwares, uh, like GPUs, uh, even you are virtualized GPUs, but uh, but you want to have a mixed workload on the same cluster, it's possible to do with uh, like tolerations and things, but uh, but it's actually we just try not to do that. It makes our man managing uh, cluster management much more complex and we, we uh, would rather choose to separate to uh, different clusters to do that. And the last is Windows Container. So uh, actually, for our, our company, we are we have a very strong um, background in Windows technologies. We use SQL servers, uh, we use IIS, and uh, we have a lot of .NET applications uh, running in, uh, in legacy applications. So, uh, but we we still try not to work with Q, uh, Windows containers at, at this point of time. We consider it's not mature enough. Um, so. Uh, so if you have choice running within those containers, you, you should definitely go that way. All right, so I think, yeah, I think that's something uh, I would like to share about, about things not easy to get right. Um, okay, so next. All right, so I think we come to almost the last uh, end of my presentation. So it's where to start with Kubernetes, uh, especially for, uh, for school, uh, university students or fresh graduates. Uh, who are going to um, work in the industry. I think um, you it can start with uh, reading the documents of Kubernetes. I think the official website uh, provides a lot of uh, useful information and um, documents to, to share to, uh, for you to understand the concepts under uh, Kubernetes. And, and then I think next, you can play around the Kubernetes in your laptop, just like uh, what I did in the demo. So you can install the Docker desktop uh, the, the actually the latest version uh, now already uh, create a cluster for you. It can you can, you can use uh, the kubectl command line two to directly talk to that. It can play around by deploying some uh, your applications in local, and even more you can doing hands on uh, if you having school projects uh, web if you develop web application for your school project you can try to use Kubernetes uh, to deploy it. So. Uh, you can go to like Google Cloud uh, free account. You can get uh, some credit and you can create a cluster for free. And also you can go to um, like freenorm.com. This is a website that provides you with uh, free uh, domain names. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's something I would like to share and about essentially how I started using it. So, all right, I think that's, that's, that's all of my, uh, my part. So uh, do you have any questions?
Yep. Thanks, Jen, oh, yeah. for, uh, for giving the talk. Yeah, I think we have like a couple, several questions in the chat. <laughs> I see. Uh, let me see. Um, all right. So, what's the difference Spanish of using Rancher come to Cube admin or on premise? Oh, this is a very good question. I think Rancher. Uh, Rancher solution. I I try not to be like sales salesperson of Rancher, but I, we find Rancher is really uh, uh, friendly to use um, um, to to uh, to 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 build our on-prem clusters. Um, basically, because of its uh, it's, it has a that uh, platform called Rancher uh, platform that you can monitor, uh, install install plugins. And, and and monitoring everything for for multiple clusters. Actually, we're using Rancher uh, now to monitor all uh, all our clusters, even on public cloud. So I find it's very useful. And and um, and also installing uh, Rancher, uh, installing a cluster on um, on prem. Uh, Rancher provides solution that you can just spin up a new container, uh, just spin up single container. Uh, you can you can. You can you can uh, you can do that. Actually, Cube Admin is something I'm 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 not uh, I'm not very familiar. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, uh, but uh, but I think I think our IT team uh, has experience had experience with uh, before Rancher. They use Cube Admin to deploy, but they find Rancher is much more uh, user friendly to use. And Rancher is also open source, and all the features is uh, free. You can use for free, uh, but you have to pay if you want support uh, support from them. Yeah. So yeah, I think I hope uh, I hope I uh, answer the question. So um, the question from um, from here, yeah, thanks. So uh, what load balance do you use for data center Kubernetes setup? What is storage for data center? Okay, so for the load balancer, uh, our own our own data center we're using F five. So uh, we use F five for our traditional applications uh, load balancing. Um, so for external setup, we do use uh, F5 as a as a um, serve as a firewall, and also uh, and uh, inside inside the uh, application uh, inside the cluster, we are using um, uh, ingress controller choice is uh, nginx ingress. So we use nginx ingress to to manage our ingresses resources in uh, in, our, in our cluster. So yeah, I think that's how we do. And for the storage wise, we're using uh, we, we have two storage uh, solutions we currently use for our own on-prem cluster. Uh, first is NFS. Uh, we do have an NFS uh, class provider, uh, storage class provider. Um, the details, I'm not very familiar with uh, this. Probably need to check with uh, my IT guys. So, um, but we do have a later one is we're using uh, a Ceph. Uh, Ceph. Um, so it's called Rook Ceph. Uh, we're using Rook Ceph for uh, as default for our storage provider, so uh, it's basically running um, a Ceph uh, on on the cluster itself using the storage uh, on each uh, each worker node. Uh, we find that performance-wise, it's much better compared to a network uh, file system. So, yeah, I think that's that's the choice we made. Uh, I hope I under uh, I I uh, answered your question for that. Uh, okay, and, and then is uh, have you experienced any DNS issues on GKE? Oh, okay. So uh, we 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 actually not using. Uh, if you, if you talk about DNS, uh, we we I assume is uh, you mentioned about uh, external DNS. So uh, external DNS is something Google Cloud provides, but actually we are now using uh, the Google DNS uh, solution, um, and we we don't encounter any DNS issues actually. Um, but if you if you encounter anything uh, you want to uh, discuss, you can you can talk to me. I think directly uh, after this talk. Uh, I think yeah, this is a race condition in Cube DNS. Oh, yeah. I think I think there's something I'm not very uh, familiar. Uh, um, I think I will take a look. Uh, if you if you uh, if you have this issue, I think I can I can take a look and see. Um, uh, what's the, what's the issue with with that? Uh, we we actually don't have. Uh, uh, such issues for DNS uh, recently. Uh, I think for for one year we don't have have that DNS issue. Yeah. So uh, another question is uh, about vertical pod scaler, auto scaler. No, we are we actually not using uh, vertical pod auto scaler. So yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I I don't have uh, quite a lot of uh, experience on that uh, so far. But but thanks for asking.
Okay. Oh, okay. So how to manage IAM role for pause and some of the requires as some cloud resource. Okay. Um, this is a good question, but actually we uh, in our company we don't uh, actually enforce a very strict rule on the uh, IAM role for 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 Google Cloud. So uh, basically our pods have access to all other cloud resources like uh, Redis, um, like uh, memory store or SQL Server, they actually have the access. So we, the security part, we are not enforcing on by IAM role right now. So yeah, things, uh, maybe that's something we should work on. Maybe we, we, we should uh, enhance our security, but so far we haven't uh, encountered any issues in this in this model. So it, it, it's, uh, yeah, sorry, I think, I don't, I don't think I can answer that question. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions from the other? No? All right. Yeah. Okay. And if no, then yeah, we are approaching uh, the end. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Cheng for uh for coming and giving a talk on the Kubernetes. Let me just share one last slide. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. sorry. We, we do have a uh, slides from HR. Uh, it's uh, oh, okay. about our. Sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I did. I forgot to mention that. So, we do have a uh, slides from uh, our. Um, are you able to see it? I can only see the Q and A. Oh yeah. Cool. All right. So yeah, we actually uh, uh we're actually hiring. This is a message from HR. So we having. Uh, uh, quite a lot of job openings uh, from developers to um, product owners, project uh, HR specialists, and also data scientists, uh, and also um, business analysts. So uh, if you're interested, you can uh, check it out, our link. Um, yeah, I think feel free to talk to our HR uh, staff. Uh, is there anything you want to add on uh, from Gene? Okay, okay. All right, all right. I think that's uh, that's all. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah.